Do I have to hold this up? Thanks. My props. So I begin in the name of Allah, God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, I first off want to thank the ISOC for inviting me today. It really is a, a great honor to be able to come and, and address you all this evening. Um, as you can imagine, this is a, a fairly thorny topic uh, of all of those that uh, one can be asked to speak on. I suppose as a convert to the faith, one realizes just how thorny it is. Uh, because when you convert, people do immediately assume that you've chosen a life of servitude and second-class second citizenship. Um, and to some extent, um, there are elements of second-class citizenship. So I suppose what I'm trying to get at in some respect is that this isn't really an East-West issue. Um, it's not so much about pointing fingers. Uh, there's a liberated woman on one side and the free woman on the other. Although if you do a Google search of the word Muslim woman, it comes up with some fantastic images. I would recommend anybody do it. Google the word uh, Muslim woman and check out the images that come up. 99% uh, uh, of the images <coughs> are indeed of um, burqa clad, fully dressed, all in black uh, women. Uh, most of them uh, are either being beaten, stoned, abused in some way. Uh, one of them is, of course, in the traditional Orientalist seductive pose with coal-lined eyes. Uh, another is, um, of course, protesting, because that's the facets of Muslim you know, female identity. We're either being abused or we are abusers by virtue of our identity. Um, and, of course, the one image that stands out against all of those, the exception to the rule, is Miss Egypt in her bikini. <laughs> yeah. So those are, those are the choices in many ways that one has uh, when we're discussing this topic, and it often does get caught in uh, these dichotomies. One often feels that one has to defend either that women in Islam are liberated, as some would love to say, or that they are deeply oppressed. And I think, I mean... I could probably answer the question now and still continue talking, that we, the answer lies somewhere in the middle. That is to say that uh, depending on where Muslim women find themselves in the world, they face different obstacles to their full emancipation. Um, the question then poses itself of whether it is in fact Islam which poses the barriers to that full emancipation, that full flourishing, or if there are other things uh, at play there. I always like to point out uh, a little pet hate of mine in the title, Women in Islam, uh, that I don't regularly hear talks entitled Men in Islam. Anyone heard of a men? No, no, didn't think so. Um, and so what that somewhat suggests to me is that Islam, the male paradigm, contains with it women in Islam. And I think that in itself is a disservice to the way that women are conceived of from the Islamic perspective. It's not women in Islam. We can talk about gender relations in Islam, if you like. We can talk about the rights of men and women in Islam. But I think the idea of women in Islam, um, when we don't often hear the uh, talk of men in Islam, somehow suggests that the dominant paradigm is male-dominated. Uh, and that, that is effectively true. Um, I also like to point out, uh, and of course this is me stealing from uh, Sheikh Suhaib Webb, uh, so if anyone's seen this, still laugh please. Um, <laughs> Sheikh Suhaib Webb, when he gives this talk, loves to throw out, throw out the question, so what is the role of a Muslim woman into the audience? And inevitably a hand goes up, to be a mother. Yeah, right, okay. Um, as, if, as if that were, you know, what we women are walking rooms. That's what we were created for. We are effectively walking wombs. Uh, as if women were not created for exactly the same purpose that men are. That is, to worship God. That is why we were created, for exactly the same reason for men, to worship God. Now, how that might become manifest may differ. We do have biological differences, and therefore there may be differences in the manifestation of that. But ultimately, in essence, we were created for 
for exactly the same purpose, and it's important to remember that. Um, I mentioned a little bit about how Muslim women seem to be taken hostage uh, between two somewhat extreme perceptions, one of which I mentioned is the, uh, I suppose, ethnocentric and, dare I say it, Islamophobic uh, approach, which assumes that uh, female emancipation can't possibly occur within an Islamic paradigm or perhaps even a religious paradigm. I think that there'd be debate on that one. Um, and on the other side, there is a very rigid, conservative uh, approach within Islam itself, which argues uh, repeatedly that, of course, Islam gave women all its rights. But when we look around many Muslim-majority countries, we're left wondering where exactly they are. Um, I suppose what the two perspectives do share in common is that they're uh, incredibly rigid uh, and difficult to um, uh, engage in dialogue uh, and discussion, and that really is a shame. Um, and of course, it's, it is, as I mentioned, uh, a fact that Muslim women live in countries where oppression masquerades as religion. That is a fact, and it is undeniable. Um, there are, if I were to say that in some European countries, fundamentalist secularism masquerades as freedom, we might also say that there are distortions at play, uh, and we might be willing to acknowledge that there are nuances that need to be understood when we're assessing these things. So the real issue, I think, for Muslim-majority countries, and I'll deal with them first and then hopefully come to the European context, is that for the most part, many of the Muslim-majority countries are trying to deal with a post-colonial heritage. Uh, and in that context, in this post-colonial context, women have become the barometer of cultural authenticity. And it, the issue, the main issue really with that, the main problem with that, is that that cultural authenticity has begun to be measured or has been measured by the extent to which the culture has remained unchanged since prior to the colonial era. So in many ways, when we look at the issue of women's rights or women in Muslim majority countries, we can't really distinguish that from the broader social and political developments which have occurred in those countries and which necessarily have an impact on people's ability to theorize about all concepts and specifically the concept of women, women's rights because of the influence that colonialism has had on people's mindsets. One of the, I think, very interesting things about any uh, culture, any outlook which is under attack or is feeling under attack is that it is unable to evolve. Anyone who, or anyone or anything which is under attack recoils into a posture of protectiveness and preservation in which the objective is to ensure that one is protected from outside influence. And when one is in that particular state of self-protection, there is very little evolution. That is to say that despite the fact throughout Islamic history, there have been processes of what we might call tajdeed wa islah, the process of renewal and reform of Islam, which is that we've seen throughout Islamic societies periods of decline in which the teachings of Islam have been viewed as uh, distancing themselves from the uh, fundamentals of the faith. And during those periods, there have been movements from within society calling for a return to those original values in order to ensure that Islam is properly understood, properly implemented, um, and properly in sync with the values, the times, the culture. Now, of course, the problem that when you are trying to reassess the fundamentals is that in order to be open to all possible uh, options in terms of one's theorizing, one needs to not be on the defensive. Because when you're on the defensive, you often end up defining yourself in a negative. Uh, and I think this is something that we do often see uh, in Muslim-majority countries, which is that if the co uh, colonialists said that, we are this. Even if, in fact, if we took a step back, the values that are being propounded are exactly the same, but by virtue of the fact that it was said by a colonizer, 
it's very difficult, and we can understand why, for former colonies to integrate those ideas or to adopt them. Um, so the reality uh, is that the depiction, for example, of women in colonial and orientalist literature, uh, which was used very much during the colonial era to justify colonial expansion. Of course, um, the French going into Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, one of their main issues, one of their main contentions as part of the mission civilisatrice, the civilising mission, was that women were oppressed, that the hijab, the headscarf, women's attire, the entire system was oppressive to women and that, of course, we, the West, were there to liberate them from these shackles. And so an entire a body of knowledge was uh, compiled on that basis. And many of the binary oppositions that were developed during the colonial era continue to really influence the way that we Muslims theorize about women in general and, uh, and other concepts, I think, within, within Islam. So that the discourse, in many ways, has come to mirror the Orientalism uh, of, of the colonial era. We started to very much internalize, internalize the way that we were perceived um, so that uh, we, we adopt almost the critique uh, as if it were a way of uh, defining ourselves. Um, now, of course, the issue is that when we want to theorize about anything, including the issue of women in Islam, we don't really want to be caught in binary oppositions, and we ideally wouldn't want to be defining ourselves in opposition to anything. Really, we want to be open on all possible options, and we need to look at where Islam can lead us. That is, I suppose, the critical mode of inquiry that one would hope to see. So despite the fact that Islam gave women the right to vote, to inherit, to education, to divorce in the 7th century, there are still many countries where cultural attitudes are hostile to these very basic rights that were given, you know, centuries ago. And of course, the issue then for onlookers is why is it that this prejudice is seemingly disguised under the cloak of religion? And how can it somehow be justified under that name? Um, I've mentioned that one of the roots of this amputation of women's rights is located in colonialism. Um, I think it's important to remember as well that as Islam expanded throughout the world, it moved into different cultures and different countries where there are already traditions, including patriarchal traditions. And some of these were integrated into the way that Islam was then understood. So, for example, the Ottoman harem was itself an emulation of the Byzantine gymnasium or the... Leg or the um, uh, concept of purda in India, which existed uh, prior to Islam. So I've talked a little bit about, in, in Muslim-majority countries, um, the fact that there are, of course, huge issues uh, to do with women's rights, to do with basic rights that they seem to have been given in the 7th century, and yet today we're uh, struggling to see them receive. Uh, the, the most basic of those rights might well be the right to education. Um, if you look at the uh, Arab Development Report, for example, um, despite huge leaps, uh, one has to say, uh, in terms of female education in the Arab world, the, the illiteracy rates amongst women continue to be shocking, um, particularly amongst rural communities. And this is all the more shocking when we realize that the very first word to be revealed in the Quran was ikra, read. You know, the very first word. And it's a commandment upon all of us within Islam to acquire an education. And so how is it that we've arrived at a situation in which there is such a dissonance between the way that women live in Muslim-majority countries and the teachings um, of the faith itself? In Europe as well, it's undeniable that there are issues to do with uh, Muslim women. Um, I mean, many of them are, are well publicized, and I, I don't need to go into them that much, but, um, you know, the usual of honor killings, forced marriages, uh, domestic violence. Um, incidentally, I do like to point out that none of these are either primarily or exclusively Muslim issues. Um, I remember um, 
a high profile politician who I shan't name, um, who was interviewed by a friend of ours, a conservative politician a few years ago, uh, and who came along uh, and he was being interviewed and he decided to come in all guns a blazing about honour killings. What is your community doing about honour killings? You know, such as the case of Parvinder Singh. Well, in case you hadn't realised, Parvinder Singh is not a Muslim name. Um, but, you know, so, so the, the point, point is that a lot of these issues are not specifically Muslim issues, and that isn't to say that Muslims don't have these issues like a lot of other people do as well. It's clear from statistics from women's associations, for example, that one in four women in the UK suffer from domestic violence. So I think issue of uh, male domination, male oppression, is uh, something that we all struggle with, that we should all be involved in seeking to eliminate. Um, the reality is that as somebody who's worked in the community for a little while, um, I am always shocked at the stories that I hear uh, about Muslim women. And sometimes I'm even shocked by the questions I get asked. Um, am I allowed to visit my mother? Um, am I allowed to work? Um, it's, it's upsetting to me that um, some of the very basic things that Muslim women enjoyed, certainly in the very earliest periods of history, seem to be now in question. Um, and it's also a really sad state of affairs, I think, that um, we rarely see uh, female Muslim speakers. We rarely see um, Muslim women coming to the fore. Um, and this is, this is a critique I launch at my fellow sisters, you know, that we need to be more invested. We need to make sure we don't rely so much on other people to glean our knowledge. We should ourselves be on the front line of the acquisition of knowledge, and we should certainly be... Uh, injecting a good dose of female interpretive, uh, uh, well, a, a good dose of female interpretation into the study uh, of Islam, because of course it, it is uh, sorely lacking. So what I'd like to do uh, this evening with that large introduction into how I was going to broach the topic um, is to look at two things really. Um, the first is um, some passages of the Quran to talk about the fundamental equality um, of men and women. And the other thing is to look at some examples throughout uh, Muslim history, which I think reflect the fact that there is such um, uh, a schism, such a, such a huge uh, and gaping <laughs> whole where Muslim women's presence should be in our literature, in our contribution, uh, in our interpretations, uh, in our scholarship in general. Um, so I will start off by uh, doing the, the first, which was looking into um, the Quran. And I suppose what I'm hoping is that what I will argue is not that the Quran can support an egalitarian reading, uh, because that would suggest that it was a, purely a matter of interpretation, uh, but rather that the Quran actually advocates gender equality, uh, with respect at the same time for differences between men and women, which may require differential treatment, uh, in some cases to fully support the different needs of the different sexes. It's, it's interesting that Again, we've come back to definitions, but you know, even the concept of equality is, is one that's hugely disputed. Uh, is equality the one-sex model or the two-sex model? Um, is it you know, equality giving people exactly the same rights, or is it giving people different rights which are respectful of their individual needs? Um, Aristotle said, justice consists not only in treating like cases alike, but also in treating different cases differently. Um, and I would argue that there are needs that are specific uh, for women and that in order, and specific for men, therefore, uh, and that therefore full equality comes from recognizing those and supporting them um, in the way that women find most uh, fulfilling. Uh, 
So we'll start with some uh, looks at, uh, a look at the Qur'an. Um, in verse um, 9 uh, slash 11, the Qur'an tells us, the believers, male and female, are the allies of one another. The concept of allies is itself uh, suggesting equality. It's suggesting an equal pairing. Um, in addition to this, there are actually uh, specific verses which then do talk about uh, uh, partnership and being a pair. Um, and of course, if I can find them in my notes, I will be able to <laughs> refer to them. Uh, for example, uh, in one of the uh, verses, in verse 971, uh, God tells us, And the believers, men and women, are protectors of one another. They enjoin good and forbid evil, and keep up pr prayer and pay zakat. So, I think in the way that we've seen those two descriptions, there's both the idea of a, a pairing, allies for one another, and protective friends. It's not the idea that men are the sole protectors, of course, there is that dimension, we'll talk about it, but we are protecting friends of one another. We are supposed to be caring for one another, supporting one another. The Prophet, peace be upon him, himself stated, Certainly women are the equals of men. Whoever honours them is honourable, and whoever disdains them is worthy of disdain. So, I think, the, I mean, the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself, is very much a manifestation of... Uh, the way that he himself would have hoped that women would be treated. Um, he was a man who was very much dedicated to his family, to his wives, to his daughters, to the well-being of the community, uh, very attentive to the needs of the women in the community, if they had any questions, any queries. Um, he was, of course, known uh, as being somebody who was very fair, and I think this is something that comes about in a lot of his treatment. He was known as being very fair, and I mean, before he was even... Uh, given the prophetic mission. And we find really a high regard and respect, what I'd call perhaps even chivalry, uh, in his uh, attitude and behavior towards women. Um, of course, we know that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was even known as Abu Zahra. He was known as father of, of Zahra, his daughter, Fatima Zahra. Um, and that his attitude towards his daughter was something w which deeply shocked the Arabs of the time. Uh, you know, they were not used to marks of deference, of respect towards women. Certainly he used to stand up when Fatima used to enter the room and they used to be, you know, shocked. Why, why would you get up? You know, it's, it's just a woman. But of course he'd, he'd point out that, yes, indeed, it's a, a woman and we should stand up and show the same markers. He would, obviously, um, there are sayings about him being affectionate to her in public and this, again, being something that was... Um, very shocking and um, we also have many sayings that talk about the fact that he really valued female qualities uh, he consulted his wives in his decisions I mean he often would go back to them to get their opinion and I think that's something that we don't really hear very much about um, there is a tendency uh, in the scholarship to uh, ignore uh, the important role that women have played uh, in developing Islam. Um, and certainly the, the bias ends up uh, with a focus on women's functionality because when men theorize about women, they don't necessarily theorize about women from a, a female perspective, a holistic perspective, so that as women, we may have a slightly different take. We may not necessarily conceive of ourselves solely as mothers, as, as wives, or as daughters, all of which are roles, but we may have a very specific take on what it is that we consider to be fulfilling. Um, and that voice is somewhat lacking, as is, as I mentioned, the attention to that female presence in scholarship and female perspective. Uh, throughout Islamic history. For example, it's interesting to note that whilst we know so much about the Sahaba, the male companions of the Prophet, so little is said of the female companions. It's interesting to note that while, whilst Muslims often quote the ten companions predicted as having a place in heaven, the Mubashirin bil Jannah, we sadly forget the twenty women companions also predicted as having a place in heaven, the Mubasharat bil Jannah. So from their female political participation, which we then contrast with what happens today and women being marginalized from this, 
uh, we say, see that the Prophet, peace be upon him, always included women in these political discussions. They were very much present. Um, women were invited to participate fully al alongside uh, men in, de in decisions and discussions. Um, and we know that some of the most widely regarded narrations of Hadith came from women, and in fact, I gather that women are overrepresented compared to men in the memorization, transmission, and narration of the hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So it's important, I think, to really remember that this female voice wasn't always absent. We know, for example, that many famous scholars were themselves students of female teachers, including, of course, Imam Shafi. Um, I was reading the other day that um, uh, Imam Shafi, in fact, asked that when he died, his funeral procession would mark a uh, pause outside the house of his former teacher, female teacher, to show how much he was indebted to her in his own knowledge. And of course, some people may know that the first university in the world, Al Qarawain University in Fez, was founded by a Muslim woman, Fatima Al Firhi. Um, so less people know, however, that Al Azhar University, the uh, possibly one of the most famous uh, institutions for Islamic learning, was also founded or constructed by uh, a Muslim woman uh, called al Khanzidara. Uh, and of course, supreme irony, we find that a few uh, centuries later, women are in fact barred from these centers of learning that they themselves helped to found. Um, so these female voices, this female presence throughout Islamic, or certainly early Islamic history, um, is not absent so much as uh, omitted. And there is therefore a real need for all of us really to uh, extract those voices, re return the balance which there was in these early sources to the co contemporary era. And one of the ways that we could do that, in my view, is to look at, of course, the examples that we have of uh, Muslim women uh, throughout Muslim history. Uh, the example of the Prophet Peter Yonim's wife Aisha, for example, is a reminder of the role that women did play in all spheres of life. Um, Aisha, the mother of the believers, as she kn she's known, contributed like none other to the Islamic heritage, and her actions in life contrast so starkly with the meekness of many of the examples of women we see today. She defended, in the name of Islam, the right to education, social and political action. And I think in order for us to really return to the original position of ideal, we need to resurrect her model. We need to remember what it was exactly that she, what she taught. Um, and remember that, you know, Islam is not a male religion, despite what some men may tell you. Uh, it doesn't favor men. And it contains with it all the tools and ethics necessary for our full emancipation. But of course, if we choose to uh, avoid educating ourselves when those tools are available to us, we are complicit in uh, maintaining the state in which we are currently in. Most people know uh, that Aisha, for example, uh, may Allah be pleased with her, was a very well-respected scholar who taught scores of men uh, and whose knowledge of Islam, as I mentioned, was second to none. Whenever any of the companions had questions, they always consulted her. Um, and the Prophet himself, peace be upon him, said that you can obtain half of your deen from Aisha. And until her death, she, w she gave fatwas and advised on a wide breadth of topics. Again, she, she would speak on issues ranging from medicine through to poetry, history, and law. Uh, according to Abu Abdullah al-Rafiqi, he says, and I quote, she had the most transmissions and the most fiqh of those who gave fatwa. She was sought out by people from the furthest lands for the knowledge of the sunnah and what is obligatory. She was wonderful in tafsir and eloquent in expression. Now, that does not sound to me like a woman chained to the kitchen sink. I could be wrong. It's important, I think, to also remember that this was not exclusive to Aisha. There were many other female companions, including Umm Sulaiman, uh, Umm Sulaim, Umm Al Darda, Fatima bin Qais al Adawiyya, and others who taught and received knowledge from and to men. Yes, that's right, they taught men. Um, one of my, again, pet hates is that I typically see female speakers being asked to speak only on the issue of 
women in Islam, as if by virtue of being a woman, we weren't capable of expressing anything of value on any other topic. Um, and that in itself, I think, is uh, um, indicative of some of the issues that we have in the community today with regards to notions of authority and knowledge. So women were present in public meetings, in consultations, and their opinions were sought just the same as that of men. Now go and tell your local mosque that. In one very famous hadith, a woman described as a rather tall woman with a somewhat broad nose. And I, said, I quote that so that we realise that her face was clearly visible, it being described. Uh, corrected the then Khalif, Omar ben Khattab, during a public address. And he recognised her point and publicly stated, the woman is right and the man is wrong. And I always like to joke that if the power relations were somehow subverted tomorrow, if somehow instead of patriarchy we had matriarchy, that we could imagine women making an entire deen out of this hadith. So that any time a man asked for his rights, we would say, the hadith says men are wrong, women are right. And we see it the other way around fairly regularly. Another female companion that I wanted to mention with a large amount of knowledge was Amra bint Abdurrahman, who was a close friend of Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. She gave legal opinions in Medina in the generation after the companions and was a foremost alima or a authority or teacher, or scholar, I should say. And in the, uh, she's mentioned in the Muwata by Imam Malik, uh, as, which of course is a reference for all scholars, not just those of the Maliki school of thought. Uh, as a primary authority on three of the central issues that he uh, refers to there. So to those who claim that women have no place in the working world, how do they reconcile this with the fact that she herself reversed the decision of a judge, who happened to be her nephew, on cutting the hand of a thief? That is to say that her opinion, her insight, her knowledge helped overturn a, uh, a judicial decision. She helped overturn... Uh, the, uh, the court's opinion on a particular issue through her knowledge. And thus her opinions were accepted in business transactions and on issues of punishment. So in the early medieval period, unlike today in some parts of the world, there were no restrictions on women pursuing studies. And we therefore find in this period women scholars, writers, poets, doctors, teachers, a whole gamut of professions. And I'm always shocked by those who insist that the woman's place is within the home are the very same men who, when they go to a hospital and cannot find a female doctor to treat their wife, are desperately upset. Well, what did you expect? Was she going to treat her from within the home? On the subject of women's right to education, Nigerian Sheikh Uthman Danfudio stated in Irshad al-Ikhwan, and I quote, if he refuses her permission, and this is her husband, if he refuses her permission to get an education, she should go without his permission. And no blame is attached to her, nor does she incur any sin thereby. The ruler should compel the husband to have his wife educated, just as he should compel him to give her adequate maintenance. Indeed, knowledge is superior to maintenance. Because, of course, I mentioned earlier on that from the Islamic perspective, the notion of oppression is linked to one's ability to fulfill oneself spiritually. Without knowledge, one cannot achieve spiritual fulfillment, and therefore depriving women from education, from fulfilling their need for knowledge, just like anybody else's need for knowledge, we are indeed oppressing them from a spiritual perspective. In the same book, the same scholar said, and I do like this quote, and I quote, O oh Muslim women, do not listen to those who are themselves misguided and who misguide others, who seek to deceive you by asking you to obey your husbands without asking you first to obey Allah and his messenger. They say that a woman's felicity lies in her obedience to her husband. They say so only to fulfill their own selfish ends and to fulfill their wishes through you. They compel you to do things which neither Allah nor his messenger has originally imposed on you, like cooking, washing clothes, and similar things which are among their numerous wishes, whilst they do not in the least demand of you to perform the real duties imposed on you by Allah and his messenger. End of quote. 
And that quote always reminds me of a, a story that a friend of mine who'd been in a lecture by um, the uh, very, um, uh, well, the, mashallah, amazing scholar, Sheikh Akram Nadwi from uh, Oxford. Um, and he is from the Hanafi Madhab. And he was explaining in a lecture in which he managed to infuriate all the men in the room um, for different reasons that um, it was not fard, it was not an obligation for women to cook or clean for their husbands. And it was not an obligation for women to live with their in-laws. And of course, the South Asian uh, audience members were furious about the comment about the in-laws. And the Arabs were all furious about the comments about the cooking and cleaning. And, um, and so he really had everyone on his back uh, that day. Uh, but indeed, I mean, it, it's interesting because sometimes people come and say to me and say, why are you telling them this? They won't do it anymore. <laughs> and I usually say, you know, I'm not really concerned that women won't do it anymore. My experience of Muslim women in the community is that, mashallah, they do more than their fair bit. More than their fair bit, mashallah. And may Allah reward them for what they do. And may Allah reward the men, the righteous men amongst us too. Um, but it's interesting to me that the reason I think it's important for us to reassert these things today is that, and he gave the analogy of, if I come to your house and you don't serve me a meal, I don't say you're a rude host. But if you do serve me a meal, I say alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah, you're a fantastic host. Thank you so much. And that's the distinction, really, that he was trying to make. He was saying, it's not wajib, it is not fad for your wife to do these things. So when she does them, be grateful. Make sure you are thankful for the things that she does for you. Because really, women do a lot of things without the recognition that they deserve. Um, and of course, on the other hand, I'm always uh, fascinated to encounter these young men, and I, usually young, but they do vary in age, um, who uh, are not particularly inclined to religion, uh, but as soon as they get married, they're incredibly literalist about what their wife should do. Not that inclined to be literalist about what they ought to do, but certainly what their wife ought to do, they know exactly what she should be doing and what she shouldn't be doing. It's very interesting that... Uh, they're so knowledgeable on these issues, really. Um, and I think that's, that's partly where, really, the, the problem comes in, you know, that we need to re-establish the balance um, so that there is a recognition for, really, a lot of the amazing work that so many uh, Muslim women really do do. Um, and it, that's, again, as I said, part of, part of the balance and the justice which exists um, in Islam. Um, I, I have no idea how long I've been rambling on for, so... Um, 45 minutes. Right, so you wanted me to... Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> um, I suppose I'll talk a little bit about, just uh, before I wrap up and take the Q&A, because I, I do like to do an extended Q&A on this topic for one reason in particular, and that is that there are a number of issues which usually characterize this topic. <laughs> the so-called um, controversial or uh, somewhat caricatured uh, issues that are, uh, or criticisms that are aimed at uh, the topic of women in Islam. But I think it's very important for Muslims to not allow themselves to be defined by the discourse about them. By which I mean, just because everybody else is telling you this is what you should talk about, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what our focus as a community should be. That is to say, people may well be obsessed by, uh, you know, headscarves and polygamy, and they are. Uh, but as Muslims, we are, we put ourselves in a very weak position when we define ourselves in opposition. That is to say, if you come forward and every time you interact with people, you begin by saying, oh, I'm not this, I'm not that. No, we don't do this. Rather than saying, actually, as Muslims, we believe in this. We are that, we are that, and we have something to contribute. 
We don't need to be on the defensive. Muslims have a lot to offer to, on the discourse on any issue, including female emancipation. And note, I didn't say Muslim female emancipation, female emancipation. Um, and one of the reasons I, I said female rather than uh, Muslim female is that we have in the uh, different models of the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, different examples of what female emancipation can really look like. Um, and that is something, I think, which contrasts with broader discourse on what uh, emancipation is. So that uh, from the Muslim perspective, uh, we might say that you could be all sorts of things. You could be uh, like Aisha, uh, a scholar, but you could choose also to be uh, a Fatima, as it were. Somebody, uh, and we know that, that Fatima, her character was much uh, calmer. She was very happy being um, a housewife, caring for her family. Um, there are diverse models in the examples of the women uh, around the Prophet, peace be upon him, which allow us really to decide exactly what type of Muslim woman we want to be. So this idea that the role of a Muslim woman is uh, very specific, very narrow, uh, that there isn't very much uh, variation, is actually not, uh, or contrast, I should say, with the reality of uh, Muslim women around the Prophet who did represent all sorts of different characteristics. Um, obviously, we had uh, Khadija, the bus businesswoman. I mentioned Aisha, the scholar, who was, of course, very fiery and led an army. Uh, to Umm Salama, who was a model of calm and reasoned intelligence. His daughter, Fatima, who, as I said, was content with looking after the home. And, of course, we have there different models of femininity. Um, you don't have to be Jordan to be recognized. Um, you can be, uh, you're looking at me like you don't know who Jordan is. You do. You all know who Jordan is. Um, <laughs> you don't? <laughs> Anybody here will let you know. Um, <laughs> um, the idea that uh, in order to be recognized, we need to live up to a particular physical manifestation. We need to live up to the alluring, the physically alluring model that uh, satisfies the male gaze in order to be recognized on a public platform is completely in contradiction with the way that femininity is described from an Islamic perspective. If you want to be a mother and that's something you find satisfying and you want to dedicate your life to your family and your kids, good on you. And you know what? You get so much reward for it. SubhanAllah. The reward, and I'm sure some of you may well know this, but um, of course the, the story is a little extended, but I'll cut it short a little bit. The reward of a, a woman, the maqam, the station of a woman who decides to stay at home and look after her family is the station of a man in jihad. It's the station of a mujahid. And then suddenly all the Muslims are like looking at me like, oh my God, where did this take a wrong turn? She's talking about jihad. Jihad understood here, of course, as uh, resistance against oppression. Yeah. Uh, so the station of a woman, the maqam of a woman who decides to make that choice is that of a mujahid. When she is at home, when you're both sitting there on the couch and she's at home and she's been looking after the house, she is getting the reward of a mujahid. And then he nudges her and says, will you get me a cup of tea? Shouldn't you be getting her the cup of tea? <laughs> She's getting the reward of a man in jihad. <laughs> Subhanallah. Um, but of course, if you would like to do other things, um, there are alternative models there for you. But all of them really focus on developing your inner core. And I think this is another difference with, I suppose, the broader model of uh, so-called female emancipation, which posits such an importance on one's physique. Um, and of course, this brings us back to the usual uh, pet topic of clothing and modesty. But in Islam, uh, we minimize the extent to which we focus on the exterior so that we might focus on the interior. We are not so much interested in being beautiful shells with hollow interiors. We are very much interested in building up our interior so that it is our 
core, our values, our ethics, our actions, which shine through. And the reason for that is that when you minimise the extent to which you're judged on your, phys on your physique, on your physical attributes, you create a public sphere in which we compete win with one another in good deeds. So that in Islam, the only type of competition which is actually uh, allowed or which is uh, viewed positively by Allah in the Quran is competition in good deeds. And in that way, once we've created this public sphere in which it's not so much what you look like, it's not so much who can best live up to this uh, I, uh, you know, sexed up male uh, ideal, uh, you have a number of consequences which flow from that. One of them is, of course, that there's uh, less cattiness amongst women. It's not so much rivalry for who can live up to, uh, you know, getting more attention. It's very much about sisterhood and helping one another to be better people, to fulfill God's objectives for all human beings on this earth. And that's why we're here. Um, so really, it allows us to focus on what's real. What's real are those virtues, those ethics, are positive actions, which is what we should be focusing our energies on, rather than focusing so much attention on something as ephemeral and meaningless as our physique. Uh, which isn't to say that you should be ugly, because of course we then go to the other extreme. God is beautiful and he loves beauty. It's not a question of saying that one needs to render oneself ugly. It's about saying that between those two extremes, there is perhaps a, is that my sign? Are you hinting? <laughs> yeah. Um, there is perhaps uh, an indication of uh, the balance that we should be trying to create uh, within ourselves, which is, as I mentioned, much greater focus on the internal uh, and less focus on uh, sort of more uh, meaningless aspects of ourselves. So um, I w perhaps we'll end uh, on uh, one last point that I wanted to make, um, which was that I talked about uh, men and women being um, allies and partners, and I think it's important to remember that there's another verse of the Quran which verse refers to uh, men and women as, and says the following, they are a garment for you and you are a garment to them. And the Quran is a very rich text, and when it uses any given term, it's important to realize what, what could we understand from that word garment. So if you think a little bit about what your garments, the, the purpose of the garments in your life serve, well, we can think that garments shield you from adverse elements. They, they beautify you, they cover up your flaws, um, they protect you. And so we come back to the idea that men and women are protective partners. We are not in this competitive, conflictual relationship which can define um, gender relations in broader society. We are there to cooperate with one another in order to further good on this earth, and that's the objective. And one last thing, if I might end on this, is I want to quote another verse which is beautiful and I think needs to be um, remembered more often, which is that and I quote from the Quran, um, among his signs is the fact that he has created spouses from you, for you from among yourselves so that you may dwell in tranquility with them. And he has planted love and mercy between you. In that are signs for people who reflect. And the reason I wanted to kind of maybe end on that is that for all of those people who think that marriage is an opportunity to impose your will on another human being by virtue of the rights that you believe have been divinely bestowed upon you. How do you reconcile that with the fact that God is telling you that he has created spouses for you so that you may dwell in tranquility with them? How can you reconcile abusing anyone when it says clearly that he's planted love and mercy between you so that the two values which are supposed to characterize the way that we deal with one another in our marriage are love and mercy. Um, and I'm going to end on that note, inshallah, and just say that I know that the issue of women's rights is often conceived of as a women, an issue for women. Um, actually, it's an issue of justice. Uh, gender justice is part of a broader struggle for justice in Islam.
and the responsibility to ensure that justice is achieved is incumbent upon all of us. This is not a woman's struggle, this is all of our struggle. And inshallah, I hope that everyone will come together, inshallah, to further the rights of our women and ensure that uh, there's balance returned to our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. and I suppose specifically non-revert sisters on the scene. Um, in my experience, to be able to um, be a public speaker, you have to have been given a certain level of self-confidence through the support of your family and your peers. Uh, and you need to not conceive of yourself as somehow lacking and I'm not sure that the way that we educate our young women is very empowering uh, in the sense that I'm not entirely sure that it always convinces them that they are equal to men and that they have the right just like men to come out and talk about Islam and express views and opinions and that they don't have to be reliant on a man in order to express those views. Um, I would ask, for example, any of you who've got sisters to think about the way or the differences perhaps between how you were raised and your sister was raised. Uh, of course, there are exceptions, uh, but um, I think in a lot of cases, um, a lot of the things that build confidence in uh, young people, including really basic things like sports, 
Um, sports achievements in sports and extracurricular activities are a way of building self-esteem, self-confidence, um, autonomy, um, and for some reason, uh, we we often see that you know a lot of young Muslim women are held back from these activities. And I think that's partly partly the reason. Um, obviously, as a revert, um, I didn't really have that complex, uh, alhamdulillah, um, and I certainly didn't find that in Islam when I converted. You can see the bit like that. Uh, of course, meeting the community was a different affair, uh, but you know the, the text itself. I didn't, I didn't find that to be true, and I think perhaps that I might have explained it partly. Um, the benefits of, of being um, a revert. Well, of course, um, I remember um, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad actually uh, describing what it's like to convert, and he said it was a little bit like when somebody had um, described the moon to you. Um, and then suddenly you see it. Like, how could anybody possibly understand what the moon really looks like until they've seen it for themselves? It's kind of like a bright sphere with kind of chunks, you know? <laughs> when you see it, subhanAllah, the moon, it's amazing, you know? Um, and I suppose realizing that there is a uh, spiritual side to yourself is possibly the most fulfilling thing that you could ever discover about yourself, realizing that there is something, there is a form of nourishment, spiritual nourishment, that you hadn't accessed prior to that. Um, of course, that's, that's hugely rewarding. And I think, um, you know, I grew up in a very, um, I think like a lot of young women, a lot of pressure to compete on, with men in all spheres, including in the workplace, for example, so that I felt the need to keep up with the achievements of my male peers in terms of uh, job success and that sort of thing. And I do think that in that sense, a lot of um, women who perhaps uh, don't have the uh, insight from the Islamic perspective of the reward that you get from choosing to look after a family at any point in time, whether it be for you know, a small amount of time or an extended period, um, feel very guilty about taking that time out. There's a lot of pressure on women not to take time uh, for family. Uh, certainly I know friends of mine who have had to hide pregnancies from their workmates so that they would get a promotion, uh, you know, because they want to be considered alongside their male peers, but if they're pregnant, this works against them. So, of course, suddenly an aspect of your femininity which you are entitled to and you shouldn't just be entitled to you're doing a service to humanity you're re reproducing the human race you have a right to be recognized for that and yet you know we're penalized for it you know women who take uh, instead of taking the six months which they should you know take two years with their first child or second child or whatever then come back to work and there's a lot of hostility you let the team down you know i think from the Islamic perspective, the idea that there is huge fulfillment to be found in those roles and it's not something to do, be demeaned is, is something very refreshing. Um, on the issue of the headscarf, um, how did I know this one would come up? Um, the headscarf, is it for men or is it for God? It's obviously for God. You wear it for God. Um, and I definitely reject the idea that um, the concept of modesty, which the headscarf is only one small part of, I do like to point that out, because people tend to make a whole religion out of the headscarf, when actually the idea is to dress modestly, and then there are certain criteria for that. But mo the, the concept of modesty applies both to men and women. It's not an exclusively female affair. Um, and though there may be difference in the manifestation of that modesty, uh, there are equal or exactly the same requirements in terms of how one behaves. So we have to lower our gaze, we have to dress modestly, we have to uh, effectively have a certain level of decorum in our I interaction. Um, but I, I certainly do not wear the headscarf because I think that men can't control themselves, which is a, a, a cliche that one hears very regularly. Um, rather, I think that there is a very natural tendency um, to focus on the outer rather than on the inner, um, and that the concept of modesty is a means of blocking that in certain situations. So that is to say, there is a very perfectly natural and healthy outlet for those 
uh, for that instinct, if you like, to appreciate uh, the outer. Uh, but certainly in the public sphere, that's not what we hope the primary focus would be on. And now, of course, the question that always comes, and presumably would be your second part of your question, would be, well, why do women have to wear the headscarf and men don't? Because a lot of people like to ask that one. Um, and I usually answer that one by saying, um, I don't know if you've ever read uh, a women's magazine, maybe Vogue or any other. I'm sure you have. Come on, once or twice in the doctor's surgery, yeah? <laughs> and um, how many or what percentage of the images in a women's magazine would you suggest were of women? Now, I've actually done statistical analysis of this, so I can tell you that it happens to be over 95%, sometimes far more than that. Women like looking at women. Now, what percentage of men do you think there are in men's magazines? Yeah? Statistically irrelevant is the answer. Less than 1%. Yeah? So the clever people who make an awful lot of money out of exploiting what seems to be a natural tendency for both men and women to prefer looking at women, uh, seem to understand something which a lot of other people don't seem to want to understand or pretend they don't understand, which is that uh, women are beautiful and this can become a slightly obsessive focus on beauty if our entire society premises female success on living up to that ideal. And so, as women, we can say, actually, we choose to limit that aspect uh, by dressing modestly. And of course, the headscarf is just one aspect of that. You know, you can, of course, be modest without a headscarf. I'm not saying you can't. This is just, if you like, it's the cherry on the cake. You still have a cake if you don't have a cherry, but you don't have a cake if you just have a cherry. Yeah? Think about it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we'll take three more questions from the floor. So please raise your hand. Uh, any more questions? Raise your hand. Okay, we'll have that lady there. That guy there. And that guy there. Part. Um, so this is a man and woman situation, and we both have to deal with the situation together to resolve. Um, like in the UK, freedom of speech is supposed to be more than in um, what well, is perceived by me than in Islamic countries. But in my opinion, here I feel that I have to be careful with what I say, especially when referring to Islamic communities and um, other communities that are not myself. Like, for example, um, uh, like once I stated that Asian people were really happy and content and such a good um, aura around them, and I was perceived as being racist, I don't know how, when I was actually complimenting them. So I think that um, why don't um, developed countries um, educate people about different cultures and religions to avoid misunderstanding between them, which I think is a huge gap. And uh, because education is obviously the tool for so many solutions, um, and it also would educate women and their rights and men, and how to view us in both ways, or both ways, and. Yes, but help us with the student. So I guess why don't we do that here? Thank you. Jazakallah, sister, for the enlightening talk. Uh, really, uh, in most of the anti-Muslim uh, websites or uh, propagandists uh, cite this reason for uh, women oppression. They say that uh, in Islam, Two women witnesses are equal to one woman witness. Could you just uh, enlighten on this? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
for a moment. Hi. Thank you so much for your lovely talk. Um, just a quick question. Uh, you did mention that there was um, a particular sheikh that you mentioned who gave a talk at Oxford, where you mentioned that it's not obligatory <coughs> for women to, um, you know, household work. Yeah. So is that was that his opinion, or is it part of the uh, the Quran Sunnah that women should not or doesn't have to do household work? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a surprise to me that it's a man asking me whether or not it's in the Quran that women have to cook and clean for them. <laughs> uh, yes, no, no, of course. Um, I'll take those in order. Um, so, uh, Islamic countries, freedom of speech, education, whoa, a whole load of things there. Um, I think one of my, uh, I mean, one of the terms that started to come about that uh, people have stopped referring, if you like, to the notion of Islamic countries and preferred the term Muslim majority countries. The reason that is, is because we don't actually know how Islamic those countries are. And so the actions or the behavior of particular peoples in those countries can't necessarily be said to reflect um, what Islam says about any particularly given issue. Uh, so, for example, on the issue of freedom of speech, I think it is absolutely impossible to understand the reaction uh, of uh, people in Muslim-majority countries to things like the Danish cartoons without understanding history, which is to say the uh, Europe... Uh, historically, and America recently, have been seen as colonial imperialist powers, have been colonial and still are imperialist powers, which have imposed their will, be it territorial expansion or cultural expansion, um, on developing countries, which many or most Muslim majority countries are. Um, and for that reason, uh, the power imbalance means that I think for very understandable reasons Muslims are very sensitive to the way that the West deals with them. There's a big history there. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot predating the Danish cartoons. They didn't come in a vacuum, yeah. Um, and so the other thing about freedom of speech is that the basic rules, I suppose, um, of politeness that usually uh, occur in, I think, interactions with different communities um, have been abused uh, when it comes to the Muslim community, which is to say that, of course, the paper has the right to publish those cartoons, but why would you want to offend, you know, one in four of the Muslim, one in four of the world's population? I mean, why? Because this is, of course, attacking Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is attacking the central figure of, you know, one of the, lo one of the main faiths in the world. And I, I think that's where the issue comes into it. I remember, uh, um, is it Omid Jalili? Anybody know? Omar, Omid Jalili, the comedian? Yeah. Who, uh, who said um, that he doesn't ever attack. He attacks religion. He attacks religious people in his co comedy sketches, but he never attacks religious figures because he says they're so close to people's hearts that it just becomes offensive uh, and I suppose that's it if you are already feeling victimized and then people then offend you your offense becomes magnified by what's preceded it um, I, I usually say it's a little bit like um, you know the woman who's been beaten for years and who one, one day you know, the man kind of gives her a little slap and he tur she turns around and stabs him. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the slap, yeah, that made her stab him. There's a lot going on before that. And any court of law would take that into account. But obviously not many people know much about the uh, antecedents to uh, things like the Danish cartoon. They just see kind of crazed Muslims burning figurines or whatever it is that they do. Um, it's also good to point out that the Prophet, peace be upon him, suffered huge um, abuse during his lifetime and didn't respond in any way comparable to that. Um, we have, for example, a story of uh, a woman who used to take it upon herself 
to pour, she would collect her garbage and keep it until she would see the prophet passing underneath her window and pour it on him every time he passed. That was her favourite pastime. And of course, one day he walked by and uh, she failed to pour the garbage. And he actually went to inquire about her and said, oh, she didn't pour the garbage on me today. I was just wondering if she was okay. You know, that's how the prophet did it. <laughs> we go and burn flags. So, you know, the behavior is not quite consistent with the example that we are supposed to follow. Um, you asked about education. I mean, I completely agree with you on education. I think it's a travesty that we don't teach um, in our school, in mainstream schools, about different religions and different philosophies. In fact, I think philosophy is a very important gateway into understanding theology, and I think it's um, a big gap. And if you, know, if you want to campaign for some uh, religious education in mainstream education, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I think it's a, it would be a very important contribution to broadening people's horizons and effectively helping them to understand both their own rights and how other people conceive of their worldviews. Um, Witnesses and financial transactions. Um, well, the, the Quran actually doesn't say that you need two female witnesses for all transactions uh, or all procedures, because of course we know that in the case of divorce, the woman is exactly, um, you know, she is a witness and the man's a witness and, and that's it. Um, the verse we're talking about actually refers specifically to financial transactions, if you like, transactions in the, work, in the marketplace, which women weren't really very involved in. Um, you, you've got to remember at the time of Islam, not many people were literate and not many, many women were literate. And very few women were engaged in those types of transactions. So what the verse actually says is um, it starts off by saying, get a scribe because these are such important transactions. You know, they would be um, devised on one day and payment could occur years later. You couldn't afford to have a mix-up on these things. You know, you'd have tribal war <laughs> over this stuff. Um, so it was very important to get that right. And so the, the beginning of it talks about scribes, the need to make sure these things are written down. And then it talks about the need for witnesses. And it says, if you fear forgetfulness, then bring two women. And what, what that's called is an illa in the text. There is a, a condition placed on the verse. That is, if you fear that they will be forgetful, then bring two. But if you don't, because she's the head of HSBC, yeah, and Allah knows best. There's a huge debate on these issues within the Muslim community, yeah. <laughs> I'm not... You know, I'm giving you one opinion here. There are many more, and I'm sure lots of people will come and uh, discuss them with me after the talk. But of course, that's, that's the truth about a lot of issues in Islam, is that we are discussing them. They're in movement. What you hear in the way people interpret it in Morocco differs from the way they understand it in Indonesia. Um, so there's, you know, a huge variety, despite what people like to think. So that would be my answer to that. Household work. Oh, Sheikh Akram. Well, um, you know, I suppose the best thing to do and what I think you really ought to do is contact Sheikh Akram on this one. Uh, but of course, him being a scholar, uh, his references are the Quran and Sunnah. Um, he is uh, traditionally trained. Um, he's a member of the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, so he's a well-respected um, scholar. Uh, but of course, he is uh, building on the Hanafi Madhab. So he's using precedents within that school of thought to express that. But if you want examples from the life of the Prophet himself, peace be upon him, we know, of course, that he mended his own socks and uh, helped in the home and uh, was always uh, willing to help his wives. So uh, I suppose there is very much evidence in the uh, Sunnah to argue this. Um, and it's not just in the Hanafi Madhab, actually. The, in the Maliki Madhab, for example, um, it's, it's considered wajib for the man to provide a, um, a domestic help to the wife if she comes from, uh, particularly if she comes from like a middle class background in which she didn't have those responsibilities in her own home. So the idea that, you know, looking after a home and a family is a huge amount of work that requires help, because I think that's the important thing to remember here, and both of those things there's a suggestion that this is a big responsibility, a big burden, and that it needs help, and whether you can afford to pay someone to do it or whether you should do it yourself, i.e. help, um, somebody's got to help. 
I think is the point now. Okay, we're now going to take the last three questions for this evening. So if um, anyone else has a question, please raise your hand higher from the air. So. Okay, so we'll take the lady there, we'll take the gentleman there. And one more question. Yes, we'll take you so you can take your second question as no one else put their hand up. So I just want to ask, I was watching the television last uh, week, uh, so it was the news from Pakistan, it's like some areas they are doing the honor killing. So what was the woman, you know, she just killed by an honor, because somebody has uh, killed her, uh, I mean, the other person who was, uh, who was the name was Ahmed, and uh, instead of him, the other lady was killed by her. So I don't know, is uh, in Quran, what did you say, like honor claim is a right, is, is there is a law that we have to kill somebody, like if somebody killed his family member? Um, so I think henceforth we shall refer to them as dishonourable killings because there is nothing honourable about honour killings. Um, the, the first thing that I have to point out is that Muslims are bound by the laws of the country in which they find themselves through the contract of citizenship. So if the law of your country, you know, that's what you should be referring to in any incidents that occur, um, whether that's in Pakistan or in England. And it should never be uh, what this is essentially rogue justice. Send your cousin out to do a hatchet job. That's what it really is. Um, and that is uh, not just unjust, it's completely contrary to the teachings of Islam. Um, and the people who are engaged in that need to fear Allah because I would not want to have to answer on Judgment Day for their actions. Um, I would say that, of course, we do know that there are a number of um, punishments stipulated in the Qur'an, and one of them, uh, very few in fact, but one of them is for murder. So purely from a, a shari'i, if you like, perspective, um, the right of the victim is for the perpetrator, she has, they have the right to ask for the death penalty for the perpetrator of the killing. Yeah? Not his cousin, or his wife, or his sister, but for the perpetrator, okay? They have the rights, but of course, in all of the Quranic verses that re refer to punishments, it says you have that right, but it would be better if you forgave. 
Yeah? And of course, Muslims seem to always forget that forgiveness is always better in the sight of Allah. So whilst we have that right, whilst you can, as a victim, request it, it's always better to forgive. Yeah? And I would say that in any of these situations, you have to go to the courts and to the legal system of your country. This rogue justice has to stop. It's absolutely unacceptable. And the consequence is, of course, women paying the highest price, as usual. Um, and it's, it's just out of order. And uh, it's important to point out that there is nothing in Islam. Uh, you know, honor killings is not an Islamic phenomenon. You know, it's completely contrary to Islam. Uh, and it needs to stop. And I think Muslims need to be actively engaged in this stuff. This isn't uh, a battle that we need to leave to other people. This is our fight. Yeah? Um, and it's something that we all need to be invested in to ensure that no, no and usually young women uh, have to pay this inordinate toll uh, for these awful cultural practices. And, yeah. Um, advice for women. I just wrote advice for women. Who asked me this one? So, yes, oh, um, what advice do I have for um, our sisters? Really, it's education all the way, you know. Um, it's about making sure that you educate yourself about your rights and that you get a marriage contract. <laughs> yeah? Marriage contract, ladies, all of you, make sure you get a marriage contract and make sure you stipulate in your marriage contract what you want and what you don't, more specifically. Um, I think it's very important uh, that women realise that marriage contracts, you know, that's, uh, that's their rights to have a marriage contract and you are fully within your rights to stipulate all sorts of things within that contract. Uh, so it's very important that you are aware of your rights so that you know what you can uh, do and what, you, uh, what, what your rights effectively are. And that's something that I saw when I was living, for example, in the Middle East, is that I would talk to women who'd be complaining about something and I'd say well but in Islam they're not allowed to do that and she said really oh are you sure he told me we are <laughs> sorry to rock the boat <laughs> but yeah um, okay sure yeah um, so in Islam we don't view uh, of course marriage is the joining together together of these two uh, souls um, but we understand that um, by the virtue of human nature, things can get complicated, and we've got something called a, a marriage contract in which you can make lots of stipulations. It's a little bit, I suppose, like a prenup. Yeah, it's a, I suppose, a Muslim version of a prenup uh, in which you can stipulate all sorts of things, uh, including standards of living, you know, what you expect from your husband. Um, you know, and you can specifically put things in there, uh, such as, you know, I don't want him to remarry. Yeah, he can't have any more wives. Yeah. Did you hear that, sisters? Yeah. Okay, so, um, of course, if you want him to have more wives, then you don't tick that box. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll, I'll come back to you if that's like, oh, is it, it's about this one, is it? Um, okay, go for it. Yeah. Uh, in the Hanbali school of thought, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, it's just in the Hanbali school, but I would have to consult um, somebody more knowledgeable, and Allah knows best. But I know that definitely in the Hanbali school, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, she, she can ask that he is willingly going to marry again, yeah. that he will divorce her straight away, without, yeah. without even going to the court or do any, yeah. anything, just straight away, um, I, I want to be divorced. Yeah. So he can give her all her, uh, you know, her um, dowry. Yeah, dowry yeah. and everything. Yeah. But this is why it's so important to get these things down in a contract, really, um, because the, the messiness of human affairs is such that... Um, the other way, um, that of course we, we want all of those things clarified uh, prior to that point. Um, how to remedy these misconceptions? Well, I suppose the best way is that, um, you know, we have to remember why, why, did, why have we got revelation? Revelation is supposed to be 
uh, a message, a guidance, a body of ethics which is there to improve the nature of our societies, to render them more ethical, more just, more fair. Yeah? And if our societies don't live up to those ethical ideals, then the best way to remedy any misconceptions is to start implementing the ethical ideals of the faith in not only our personal life, but of course in, in the world around us. So, um, I mean, I always say it, it all starts at home, really. You start by being the best husband you can be, um, and the best father you can be, and then the best member of your family, the best member of your community, and it should really uh, move from there on out. But ideally, it's about bringing our behavior in line with our ethics. At the moment, we have this uh, discourse about Islam, and it's so great, and it says all this stuff, and our behavior is all the way over there and completely disconnected from it. Um, and Islam is not um, a badge of honor. It's, you know, it's something which is supposed to be manifest on, in our actions. You know, I think it's... Uh, it's sad that we've almost relegated it to decorative signs on our walls or, you know, the Quran hanging from our car, uh, you know, what is it, mirror. Uh, you know, that's, it's almost become ornamental. Um, and I remember one sheikh saying once, um, some people uh, make religion into fun and fun into a religion. Um, and unfortunately, we have as Muslims haven't escaped that. You know, it's like... Um, Religion should be taken seriously. It's it's uh, it's a form of guidance, supposed to be something which helps us to become better human beings and create a more balanced, harmonious world. If the world isn't in that state, then we've got a lot lot of work to do. Effectively, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Inshallah.